Hi there. I'm Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. This is the latest in a series of online video lessons intended to provide you important principles and helpful concepts for the study of communication. In this video, we're going to tackle a topic that has practical implications for all manner of different areas of our lives from our processes of interpersonal interaction with our families and friend groups to professional career applications in private sector and nonprofit business activities to the functioning of public policy as it operates in governing bodies all across the world. And that is the topic of group decision making. Small groups can be really powerful engines for decision making and action, but they're also potentially vulnerable to some really important deficits that need to be accounted for in order to effectively act as a decision making body. So after a very brief reminder of some key concepts from a prior video on small group communication, we want to look specifically into what some of those problematic aspects of group dynamics might be, and then introduce a couple of theoretical models that provide important conceptual resources for how we can improve decision making in small groups. In a previous video in this series, we defined small group communication as interactions among three or more people who are connected through a common purpose, mutual influence, and a shared identity. So what's important about the identity of small groups is that they see themselves as a gestalt, as an entity whose whole is more important and more effective than the sum of its parts. If you understand yourself as a member of a group that all has a similar goal in mind and who is all working together to influence one another in order to approach that goal or outcome, it can be a pretty powerful element of identity. Now, small groups have some very distinct advantages when it comes to decision making and action. Small groups share the decision making and they share the resources that are necessary in order to make those decisions. Each individual that comes into a small group brings with them their own knowledge and past experiences, their own skill sets, their own perspectives and point of view based on their own backgrounds. And when all of these different resources come together, especially in a way where they play off of one another productively, you have the capacity for what's known as synergy. The potential for gains in performance or heightened quality of interactions when complementary members or member characteristics are added to existing ones. Think about the different members of a small group as individual puzzle pieces that go into a larger picture. Each individual member is going to provide some resources and some capacities that other group members might not be able to in order to ultimately complement one another and create this gestalt experience. And so the research tells us that all else being equal, small groups tend to be far superior to individuals when it comes to making accurate decisions and being productive in taking action through the use of collaborative work sharing. Now what you can see in these first three points is another very important fourth point that's an advantage of small groups when you've got it, and that's exposure to diversity. The ability to achieve optimal synergy in a small group really depends on there being diversity in terms of the type of people and the various sorts of resources that they're bringing to the table to contribute to the group as a whole. If you've got a group that is relatively homogenous, that pretty much knows the same things and has the same skills and has more or less the same perspective or point of view, you're not going to get the different kinds of knowledge and skills and points of view that are going to synergistically fill in the gaps, and then that can cause some problems. More on this point in just a bit. We need to think, of course, about some other drawbacks of small groups as well. Of course, small groups compared to individuals are going to make decisions and they're going to take action slower, in part because there's more deliberation and interaction that leads to the decision making and action. And so that can be a good thing when you act more slowly. But there's always the possibility for the small groups to also act in ways that are inefficient and counterproductive, and that's slower decision making and action that doesn't help you. Of course, when you're dealing with groups instead of individuals, organizational coordination is going to be really important. In terms of time and space and the various resources that folks have access to, you need to be able to put all of the pieces in place, and that can sometimes be very difficult. Small groups also need an other-centered standpoint on the part of individual members. If 
the members of a small group are thinking about the group as an entity that has a common identity and a common goal, this is what's referred to as an other-centered standpoint. I need to think about the others in the group, and I need to think about the group as something that I am a part of, something that is larger than myself. We've all had experiences with individual members of groups that have tended to prioritize their own individual priorities, their own individual comfort or desire to work or not, and this often results in what's referred to as social loafing. Social loafing isn't just a manifestation of laziness, but actually, for some folks, it is a rational decision based on cost-benefit analysis. If this group is going to get the task accomplished, then why do I have to spend a bunch of time and effort actually contributing to it? Because I know it's going to get done. Now, the problem is it may well get done, but firstly, the onus is going to be on the remaining members of the group, which are going to have proportionately fewer resources and more work responsibility to get the same amount of work done. And secondly, you're not necessarily going to have the complete diversity of perspectives, knowledge, and skill sets that you would if everybody was contributing. So there are a variety of things that small groups are going to have to think about and act on proactively if they're going to be effective. Now, what we need to do at this point is to take things a bit further and to consider some important identity variables in group dynamics that can make things really problematic. One of those, which is relatively complex, is the notion of conformity. You'll recall just a couple of minutes ago, I said that exposure to diversity in terms of different kinds of people and different points of view is something that's really important in order to achieve optimal synergy. Now, that's not to say that all conformity is going to be problematic in a small group. Indeed, some amount of acceptance of group norms and rules is going to be necessary. If you're going to have a shared identity and a shared sense of common purpose and common goals, if you're going to avoid things like a lack of an other-centered orientation and social loafing, then you're going to have to have everybody in the group, even if they're different kinds of people, to accept some code of conduct. Here are some ground rules and parameters for what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Here are the expectations that we've established, and we're going to hold ourselves mutually accountable in order to get those things done. And so a lot of folks studying small group communication talk about the idea of conformity pressures. These are internal or external mechanisms for complying with norms. When you're thinking about external conformity pressures, that may be the rules or the regulations or the expectations that's imposed on a group from the outside. For instance, if you're on a work team at your place of employment and the boss is telling you, this is what you need to do, these are the rules you have to follow. On the other hand, internal mechanisms for conformity pressure are those things that a group is going to develop within itself in order to try to determine what's going to be our norms and rules of conduct, how are we going to hold each other accountable. Conformity pressures thought about in this way can be really beneficial. The benefits for conformity on this level is that it can increase membership satisfaction and improve task performance. Members in a group feel good about being in that group, and the overall end product is just going to be better. However, on the other hand, the drawbacks are that conformity pressure can cause conflict and stress, because sometimes we don't want to conform. And sometimes our deep desire and drive to conform can actually cause some additional problems. To explain what I mean on this last point, I need to take you back to history, and specifically the period of February to April 1961, and the Bay of Pigs invasion that was led by President John F. Kennedy and his administration. The Bay of Pigs, in short, is a beach location on the shore of Cuba, and it was the site of an invasion of the Castro regime in 1961 by anti-communist Cuban refugees that had been mobilized and trained by the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States to invade the communist nation of Cuba and overthrow Fidel Castro and put in place an anti-communist form of government. President Kennedy was inaugurated in January 1961 and inherited plans for a covert invasion of Cuba from the preceding Eisenhower administration. 
Over the course of several months, Kennedy and his national security team made some specific decisions about where they were going to launch the invasion, uh, where they were going to land and strike the invasion source from, hence the name the Bay of Pigs. And a variety of measures were put in place to keep the operation secret and to try to make sure that the United States had no direct boots on the ground in terms of American armed forces that would be involved in the invasion. Now, history tells us that the April 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion was a huge fiasco. It was a terrible decision that led to an utter flop of a military invasion. All of the anti-Castro forces were killed or taken prisoner by the Castro regime, and it was an amazing diplomatic and national security blow for the Kennedy administration that he wouldn't really rebound from until over a year later with the Kennedy administration's successful negotiation of the Cuban Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. But here's the point for our current purposes. How could such a team of brilliant, experienced experts in the White House make such a bad decision? I want to draw your attention to a video that was produced by the University of Massachusetts College of Law at Andover in 2011. There's an interview with an author who researched the Bay of Pigs decision and drew some important conclusions from what would become a seminally important theory of group communication and how it can go poorly. These people were almost too smart. They yeah. had always been enormously successful. They couldn't fathom how they could be such failures. Well, that's that's the title of the book, The Brilliant Disaster, and it's, it's ironic, of course, and it's oxymoronic, but the, the brilliant part is the men who did it. Yeah. They were the best and the brightest, and, uh, you know, you, he, a number of Rhodes Scholars, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, had been a Rhodes Scholar. There were many Rhodes Scholars. There was um, McGeorge Bundy, who'd been uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Harvard at the age of 34. He was just, I think, 42 at the time. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, had been the president of Ford Motor Company at the age of 40. All of these guys were really smart and really successful and had never really failed at anything. And I do think you have to attribute part of what happened to the fact that when they got in a room together and they looked around at each other, they saw a lot of brilliant people who they respected and they, they in themselves they saw people who did not fail and they forgot about Mur Murphy's Law. Uh, you know, things go wrong. Yeah. So I jokingly yeah. say it, it might have helped to have a few less brilliant people, regular people, uh, you know, in presidential administrations. Uh, people like me, for instance, I'm available. People to point out that things don't always go the way you plan them. And that would have been a good thing for, yeah. for people and, to think about. And people about. who ask what are thought to be dumb questions. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. And nobody, nobody wanted to embarrass themselves by asking those dumb questions. Right. And that, I take it, is part of why you say that groupthink took over. Yes. Uh, groupthink did. Uh, there were a number of factors, I think, that, that led to this bad decision. You have to forgive them a little bit because this did occur only three months into the beginning of the administration. And a lot of these, they were still finding their way to the men's room. I mean, they hadn't gotten their sea legs yet. And then they also were, they didn't want to embarrass themselves in yeah. front of the president, so, yeah. or in front of each other. Uh, but Groupthink is the famous book by Irving Janis, written in 1972, that was inspired by the Bay of Pigs. He was asking himself, how could it be that all these smart people could make such a bad decision? And he came up with a theory that when you get people of similar backgrounds into yeah. a room, yeah. There is a, 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 an impetus to agree with each other. Uh, nobody wants to stand out, particularly when, I mean, these guys really did come from, they had similar resumes. A lot of them had gone to East Coast boarding schools, Ivy League colleges. They knew each other socially. Uh, they had reason to agree with each other and to assume the other guy was right. Uh, and. Uh, the one person, I mean, there's the, the Irving Janis's book really refers to one meeting particularly that happened just over 10 days before the invasion, April 4th of 1961, when you had all these guys in a conference room in the State Department. Uh, 
and they go and Kennedy goes around and asks them what they think and they all vote for it. Now later they all say they had major reservations about it, but they didn't voice them at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one guy who did voice reservations was an outsider. It was a senator who really shouldn't have been at that meeting, Senator William Fulbright. Right. Kennedy had invited him in knowing that he had problems with the plan. And he got up and gave this rousing speech about how this was a terrible idea, un-American, um, impractical, wrong in, in every respect. And he became what the foil that everybody sort of ganged up on. Yeah. And as Janice wrote, it really only confirmed what people believed. You know, when you have one person that you can say, oh, he's the, he's the outsider, uh, those who already are prone to agree with each other, it, it, it sort of uh, solidifies their belief in their own opinion. As you can see from this interview, the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a traumatically horrible decision, was, according to at least one prominent scholar, was the result of a decision-making process that simply lacked the kind of internal diversity and critical thinking that it needed. Irving Janis wrote the book Groupthink. The first edition was in 1972, the second edition published 10 years later. He defines groupthink like this. In brief, it's a lack of critical evaluation of proposed ideas or courses of action that results from high levels of cohesion and or high conformity pressures. Now, note some of the pieces that are involved here. On the one hand, we're talking about groups that have high levels of cohesion. In a previous video in the series, we talked about the idea of cohesion as a relatively positive thing. A cohesive group is one in which the individual members like and understand each other, and they're all liking the goals and purposes of the group that they're in. Cohesion is often a really great thing. However, cohesion can go too far when it leads to conformity that is really not all that critical. If nobody is willing to, as was described in this video, ask the dumb questions, or take devil's advocate positions, or otherwise try to test the ideas of other people in the group due to internal high conformity pressures, what you have is a group of people that are all very willing to go along to get along, without ever really critically evaluating what the problems and solutions are. And so what happens in groupthink is essentially the elimination of many of the benefits of task-oriented groups. All of those things that groups can do that individuals can't essentially get chucked out the window when everybody is essentially just conforming to the same positions. And so in order to avoid groupthink, groups really need to normalize active input, questioning of premises and conclusions, and reasonable dissent. Argument and conflict are not necessarily bad things, and this is where a lot of groups, especially student groups and less professionally experienced professional groups in the workplace, often get it wrong. Just because everybody gets along nicely doesn't necessarily mean that the best decisions are being made. You need arguments, you need people to question assumptions. So, how do we actually go about that so that we can avoid an excess of conformity and the possibility of groupthink? Well, the first really important theory to come down the pike that would address this sort of issue actually predates the theory of groupthink by a few decades. And that's John Dewey's theory of reflective thinking. John Dewey was a social theorist who was also critically influential in the development of journalism as a field, as well as in the development of modern educational and learning theory. Dewey was quite a guy. In any event, reflective thinking, according to Dewey in his seminal work, How We Think, is active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the grounds that support it and the further conclusions to which it tends. In other words, if we end up taking a position, we need to be able to identify what's supporting that position, what sort of conclusions are going to lead from accepting this position, and we need to be active and careful about questioning all of those assumptions before we actually draw conclusions and act upon them. So folks that have worked on developing Dewey's theory of reflective thinking have developed a model for group decision making that looks a little bit like this. The first step for any group would be to define the problem. If your group is faced with completing a specific task, you need to determine why that task is being required. What is the nature of the problem? What is it that makes that problem a problem? 
And once you get a sense of what that problem is, then you want to dig even deeper to the second step, which is to analyze the problem. Breaking the problem down into its component parts. What are the various aspects of this problematic situation that need to be addressed in any kind of solution that we might potentially come up with? The third step for Dewey, then, is once we know the bits and pieces of the problem, we need to establish criteria for a solution. In other words, if we come up with an idea for a possible way to solve the problem, what kinds of standards or what kinds of benchmarks is that idea going to have to meet in order for us to deem it a successful solution to the problem? So a group that's thinking about this in advance is going to establish those standards. A sufficient action that's going to respond to the elements of the problem that we've identified is going to have to address X, Y, and Z. And if it doesn't address X, Y, and Z, then it's not a solution that we want to entertain. So, you figure out what the nature of the problem is, you break it down into its bits and pieces, you establish the criteria or standards for what's a good solution, and then you start generating possible solutions. Here's one option for solving the problem, here's a second option for solving the problem, here's a third option for solving the problem, and then what you do is you select the best solution. And you select that best solution by taking each of your possible solutions and running them through the engine of the criteria you've established. If option one meets the criteria, option two doesn't meet the criteria, option three partially meets the criteria, then you know that you've got at least one solution that's going to meet all of your standards. And perhaps you've got a couple of different solutions that are both going to potentially meet the criteria for your solution. And then, in that case, you can drill down a bit to weigh the specific advantages and disadvantages of each of those approaches above and beyond those criteria. The key thing to bear in mind here, of course, is that this is a very systematic model that looks at the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve and then generates a number of different solutions not just one that somebody comes up with quickly, but a number of different possibilities. And then those different possibilities are all going to be tested by bringing it back to the nature of the problem through these standards or criteria that provide a basis for understanding, is this actually going to solve the problem or maybe not? So this is Dewey's reflective thinking model, and it stood the test of time for quite some time until we get some innovations in the 1980s from communication scholars Garan and Hirakawa in developing a theory that they referred to as a functional perspective of group decision making. Garan and Hirakawa essentially accept the premises of Dewey's reflective thinking because... It's the bomb. It really makes a lot of sense in terms of critical thinking, being systematic and complete about making a good decision. However, they found some really interesting things in the research that they did on how small groups actually utilize the reflective thinking model. And what they discovered is that as long as the primary functions of effective decision making are addressed by a group, the specific order doesn't always matter to the outcome. So, in other words, if we've got five steps of the reflective thinking model, according to Dewey, that we just discussed, Garan and Hirakawa would argue that as long as you're doing those things, they don't necessarily have to be done in sequential 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 order. As a consequence, the functional perspective model that Garan and Hirakawa come up with is going to be really familiar. It's, there's a lot of similarities and parallels to Dewey's reflective thinking model, but there's some important procedural and conceptual differences. And it's a bit streamlined too. First of all is the concept of problem analysis. And this essentially combines the ideas from Dewey's model of defining what kind of problem you have and analyzing the nature of that problem, breaking it down into its component parts. The second function of decision making that groups have to tackle, according to Garan and Hirakawa, is goal setting. And setting goals for your solution essentially is parallel to Dewey's notion of establishing the criteria for a solution. When you set goals for the action that you want to take, what you're doing is essentially saying, our final decision needs to accomplish goals X, Y, and Z. And if the solution we come up with does not accomplish X, Y, and Z, it doesn't meet our goals, and so we don't want to do it. The third function that needs to be fulfilled in this perspective is identifying alternative solutions. And you can see this is directly parallel to Dewey's model again. 
And the fourth element of this model is evaluating the positive characteristics and the negative characteristics of each of these alternative solutions. In many ways, this is very parallel to Dewey's reflective thinking model. So at this point now, you're thinking to yourself, well, why in the world do we need two of these models if essentially this is just a rehash of Dewey's older model? Here's where things get different. According to Garan and Hirakawa's research, these steps do not have to be done in the same order. In fact, all of these functions are going to happen multiple times back and forth over the course of the interactions that the group is going to have as they're developing their solution. You may have been in a project group, for instance, for an assignment for class or something connected to a team assignment that you had at the workplace. And sometimes what happens is folks will jump immediately to their solutions, right? Well, how about this idea? We could do this or maybe we could do this. Somebody else will come to the conversation and say, well, why do you want to implement that solution? And then you might say, well, because it's going to do X, Y, and Z the goals, perhaps, for what this solution might accomplish. And those are positive characteristics of these goals. And somebody else then might ask, well, are those the real goals that we need? And that might require folks then to start thinking about, well, we might want to establish the goals based on the nature of the problem. And the more that the discussion takes place, sometimes what groups are going to find is the more that they talk about the different solutions and try to figure out the positive and the negative characteristics of those solutions, they end up getting a better understanding over time of what the actual underlying problem might be. And then once they have a better understanding and analysis of the problem, then they can start doubling back to setting and resetting and evolving the goals that they have, thus potentially rejecting certain solutions because now they no longer fit the nature of the problem we have. And maybe we come up with some different alternative solutions because they're going to better fit the problem and the goals that we've revised. So this can be a process that keeps going and going until ultimately the group is going to select the best decision. So what's important to take away from these theories is first of all, there are some components that are going to be in common that any small group engaging in decision making really needs to consider. You have to specifically think about what is the nature of your problem and what are the various aspects of that problem, the things that make that problem a problem, the things that you need to address. You need to think about what your ultimate objective needs to include. What standards or criteria does the solution have to meet in order to achieve whatever goals that you're setting? You need to be able to identify and brainstorm and then test multiple alternative solutions. You don't just want one person with a strong personality to come up with an idea and then everybody wanting to avoid conflict essentially jumps onto that idea. That's where groupthink comes from. And then ultimately, you need to engage in the critical process of evaluating each of those alternative solutions based on the standards or criteria or the goals that your group has developed. And only then do you want to select a solution that ultimately is going to respond to your problem and meet all of the standards and criteria that will help your solution achieve the goals that you've identified. And of course, in order for this kind of decision-making process to be optimal, the group really needs to take advantage of the opportunities for synergy, in other words, for the various resources and, importantly for the conclusion of this video, different perspectives, different points of view, the willingness to question and play devil's advocate and offer alternatives in order to fully engage any possible solutions. Only then are you going to get the best decision. And that's why having and encouraging an exposure to diversity, not just different kinds of people, but people with different points of view and different skill sets that are going to be able to provide that complementary function for one another. If you can have a synergistic, diverse group that can pool their resources together and engage in a reflective process meeting all of the important functions of a small group decision-making process, that's how you get the optimal solution. And that, in an oversimplified nutshell, are some important theoretical principles for group decision-making. If you've got any questions about this or any of the other videos in this series, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.